Welcome to uh, Witness in Palestine. This is show number three. Um, between now and our last show, which was with uh, Suzanne Abulawa and Francesca Albanese, a lot of things have happened in, uh, in Palestine. Um, the Israel onslaught has, has continued. More people have died. More innocent civilians have died. More babies have died. More women have died. Um, but something quite momentous happened also last Friday when the World Court, the International Court of Justice, found that there were actually grounds to believe that Israel's action in Gaza could amount to genocide and therefore imposed uh, provisional measures to try to stop it. To discuss this and, and, and much more, I am joined today by a truly amazing guest that um, needs no introduction, uh, Angela Davis. Hello, Angela. Hi, Frank. Thank you for inviting me to participate in your program. Uh, it's it's a pleasure and it's an honor, you know, to speak to you again. It's been it's been a while, so it's nice to see you again. Uh, I wanted to uh, to start by asking you, you know, every time I hear you talk or I heard you talk, every time um, I read something you you you've written, um, Palestine is present, you know, in 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 your speeches, in your writing. Um, we have experienced in the last three months something I wish no one would have would ever have to live to go through or to witness. Uh, pretty much the annihilation of a people live on our screens, which made it even worse, I guess, by the state of Israel. I I I spoke to Nura that you also know very well, Nura Erekat, uh, recently, yes. and we talked about the fact that we really felt like these last three months were kind of a, a really a collective trauma, you know, of, of people, again, experiencing a genocide uh, live. Um, and I wanted to start in a way by asking you about Palestine in particular, to, to ask about, in a way, your own journey of understanding when it comes to, to Palestine. And I want to ask you, how important was your visit to Palestine in 2011? Well, uh, first of all, uh, Frank, I should um, tell you that I've actually been reflecting on uh, my own trajectory um, uh, with respect to solidarity with Palestine. And you know, I've been remembering um, what it was like to attend a university which was founded in the same year as the State of Israel, what it was like to um, actually... Uh, learn to experience solidarity with Palestinian people uh, from my Jewish classmates uh, at Brandeis and thinking about the conversations, the sort of subterranean conversations that happened uh, on, on the campus uh, when the administration always emphasized the importance of Brandeis supporting the the, the state of um, Israel. Um, so I I've had a very long journey um, that um, you know has involved um, um, Palestinian political prisoners supporting me when when I was in jail. That has involved meeting um, um, Arafat at the World. Um, Festival for uh, uh, youth and students in 1973, I believe it was in East Germany. Um, and I've come to realize that my own sense of myself as a political being uh, is very much linked to uh, the ways in which uh, I've learned how to uh, experience and organize for solidarity uh, with, with Palestine. It seems to me that Palestine represents uh, to this generation what South Africa uh, represented uh, to older uh, generations. Uh, and the sense that um, it has to be incorporated into every social justice agenda, particularly now, given this genocidal 
assault on, 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 on the people of Gaza. Uh, so on the one hand, I'm very, I'm very sad. Uh, and I, I know that this is uh, an emotional issue, not only a political issue for so many people around uh, the world. But at the same time, I'm happy uh, to uh, witness um, a kind of massive show of support uh, for uh, people in Gaza and to see people standing up to Zionism as they never have before in my own experience. And so my visit to Palestine in um, 2011 was really a, a kind of a turning point for me. I had been involved in solidarity efforts for Palestine since my days in college. Uh, uh, but it was um, visiting Palestine and recognizing that as much as I thought I knew about uh, the uh, situation of apartheid in South Africa that I really didn't. Uh, and it brought forth memories of growing up in the most segregated uh, city of the United States. Uh, it um, made me recognize that in so many respects, uh, 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 the situation that Israel has created for, for uh, uh, Palestinians, Palestinians was far worse than anything that I had ever experienced. Uh, and, and so uh, those of us who went on that delegation, it was a delegation of, of, um, of, of women of color and indigenous women who were scholar activists. Uh, uh, we all made a strong commitment uh, that we would um, uh, continue to do the work that we were doing, but, but even more so, to try to help guarantee that uh, the question of Palestine was incorporated into social justice issues and, and social justice agendas, no matter what the particular focus. Uh, for too long, uh, there were all of the social justice issues, movements against racism, movements for gender equality, uh, um, movements against war in other parts of the world. And then there was, Palestine as a separate issue. And so we made a commitment uh, to ourselves and to the world to try to um, assist in breaking uh, that uh, isolation that had been uh, uh, responsible for the fact that so many people around the world, and especially here in the US, simply did not know what was happening in Palestine. It's interesting to hear you say this because that's exactly how I felt in during my first visit in 20, in 2007. As much as I thought I knew, when I got there, it really radically changed every, everything. You know, I thought there was no turning point. And I remember reading Arundhati Roy, who said, like, um, sometimes like you see it and you can't unsee it. And that's exactly how I felt after I came back. You know, um, it sort of rad radically changed um, everything in a way, the, the way I put Palestine um, in the midst of other struggles and things. Uh, so um, I wanted to ask you about a, a person as well, uh, June Jordan. In 1982, June Jordan wrote a long poem that included, I was born a black woman and now I become Palestinian. I was wondering how much influence she had in maybe inspiring African Americans and others to actually understand what Palestine truly was. And I was wondering if you, if you I guess, knew June Jordan? Well, oh. uh, you know, uh, Frank, uh, uh, June was a very close friend. Um, and she was a pioneer in, with respect to um, efforts to generate solidarity uh, for Palestine. And that poem that you refer to, Moving uh, Toward Home, uh, is a really powerful expression uh, of, um, of the need for solidarity, um, especially lines of solidarity linking uh, Black people in the US uh, with uh, Palestinians. Uh, uh, 
Yes, in the 1980s, uh, uh, June was traveling to Lebanon in the aftermath of the war there. She was um, engaged in conversations with those who were still very much influenced by Zionism. Uh, um, Adrian Rich, for example, who was a uh, well-known poet, had an extended engagement. Well, they were they they became friends, uh, but initially, uh, uh, um, uh, June was very critical of Adrian for failing to recognize uh, uh, the place of Palestine in in our imagination, uh, and so eventually, uh, Adrian became a very powerful. Um, uh, representative of the, the 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 need to challenge the state of Israel uh, uh, to challenge the US for its uh, uh, alliance uh, with Israel for being the most powerful ally uh, that Israel is able uh, to claim um, yeah I could talk I could talk about uh, June uh, forever and I I find myself during this period um, and as a matter of fact, since the demonstrations in um, uh, the, in, in 2014 that took place um, in Ferguson, uh, when we began to see a, a, a visible uh, show of support for Palestine among young black people with dream defenders, uh, uh, et cetera. So I, I find myself, um, of wishing that June were still here uh, because she is certainly responsible uh, in many ways uh, for the this development of, of a sense of political uh, kinship between black communities in the US and Palestinians who are struggling for their freedom. But that is an amazing poem. Uh, there's also the poem uh, that is, um, uh, about the war in Lebanon, uh, and it is, uh, if one reads it, it reads like a description of what is happening in Gaza today. Yeah, I really and, miss her. yeah, <laughs> I, I think, you know, we all, we all miss her and, her, her, you know, her writing, her poems, her, her influence. Uh, again, it's interesting you saying that reading June's poem about Lebanon, you, you feel like it's what's happening in, in Gaza now. Um, I recently found a video of yours at the Russell Tribunal, I think it was in 2014, at the last session in Brussels, where you gave one of the closing speech. And listening to the speech, you could put it today, change a few dates, and it's again exactly what's happening in Gaza now, maybe times 10, but the, the, you know, the process, the pattern is actually exactly the same, uh, we, which shows that, again, history didn't start, you know, on October 7th, as, as we, as you know. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And, mm. and, and, and there is a, there's a dimension of, of Zionism that refuses to recognize history, that, that, that has wanted to freeze history at a particular moment, uh, so that even in, um, in, 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 in 2024, when we're looking back at the events of, of last fall, uh, we see that um, we see that uh, the discourse of the government uh, and the discourse of uh, the Zionist support for the government uh, recreates the very history out of which the state of Israel was born. And I think that that makes us, um, that causes us to be critical of the very process of establishing a state, a nation state on the basis of uh, of, of preventing um, uh, catastrophic assaults on, uh, um, on humans. Uh, uh, and seeing that state as the only possible answer to those catastrophes, uh, recognizing that the state relies on the military, it relies on violence, it relies on war, so that it means that the only way to really respond is 
through violence. I think I'm, I'm, I'm hoping this will also, this period will also inspire us to have uh, different ways of imagining the future outside of the framework uh, of uh, the, um, the nation state with its uh, uh, military and all of its, its police and its you know, various uh, uh, forms of violence. I guess an abolitionist perspective is is needed now more than more than ever. Um, I, I, I wanted to uh, to also ask you um, about something you often spoke about: um, black internationalism. Recently, um, I was with uh, with an organization, a Palestine organization I'm, I'm working with, and talking about you know strategy and stuff. We realized that a lot of the work charities, organizations, NGOs working on Palestine do is very, you know, Euro-centered or Western-centered, right? We're trying to lobby IMPs in London, in the US, we're trying. But when you hear about the response right now of the West, um, you realize, and when you see the response of the global South, the majority world, you realize that in a way we're wrong. We should build very strong alliances with the global south, with the majority world, because we cannot expect uh, the people that actually are pulling the strings and are making Israel, you know, are allowing Israel to do what it does, to one day again give the privilege, privileges away and, and stop. So I was wondering if that's what you, in a way, meant uh, by black inter internationalism. And we spoke about this with Susan, actually, Abu Hawa a few days ago as well. The need for us to build alliances with the global south, which is the majority world. Um, well, yeah, that's definitely uh, um, in, in, in important, particularly south-south alliances. I think the problem that you're referring to is the fact that uh, uh, there's been the assumption that all alliances need to be rooted through the global north. Uh, uh, and and so therefore, uh, many uh, you know very productive engagements uh, between people who live in the global south have been uh, prevented. Uh, but I think that um, that um, I'm reminded uh, by your your question of something that. Uh, uh, w. E. B. Du Bois pointed out many, many decades ago uh, when he when he talked about um, the the best kind of pan Africanism, uh, the best uh, way to pursue a kind of pan Africanism, which many people at the time were thinking about only because of the racial kinship between. Uh, Black people in the U.S., for example, and black people in 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 in, in Africa, and Du Bois uh, pointed out uh, that um, that it was not racial kinship that would produce uh, the kind of internationalism and the kind of solidarity we needed, but rather recognizing that anti-imperialist efforts were at the very heart or needed to be at the very heart of those alliances. Uh, so not uh, alliances formalistically based on some notion of race, but rather on very concrete um, solidarity and, and commitments of solidarity uh, that uh, brought, that would bring people of African descent together with people uh, uh, all over the world who were also struggling against uh, anti-imperialism. But I think internationalism has always been an important dimension of black struggles. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I think back to the to the the period when people like Frederick Douglass uh, 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 traveled to Europe uh, and Ida B. Wells later during the anti-lynching movement, travel uh, uh, abroad in order to garner support uh, for that movement. In many ways, Black people in the U.S. have always been the beneficiaries of international solidarity. Uh, and there have been those uh, who recognize that we not only uh, should uh, see ourselves as beneficiaries 
of solidarity, but also as forgers uh, of, 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 of solidarity uh, for people around uh, the world who are oppressed uh, by capitalism, by racial capitalism, as a matter of fact. Uh, because if we, we talk about challenging racism, uh, it, it, it has to express itself in an awareness of the role that capitalism has played in producing uh, racism. And as, um, as many people have pointed out, the system of capitalism we know now is racial capitalism. Uh, uh, and therefore, uh, without a dimension of internationalism, uh, there's no possibility of even beginning to um, to organize uh, for its downfall. In a way, in this regard, how important was it, in your opinion, that South Africa launched the case at the uh, International Court of Justice uh, against Israel? Um, well... Um, you know, first of all, um, I know many of us are still very emotionally connected to what we imagine a victory for South Africa would bring to the world. South Africa was our hope. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, it, because of global capitalism, you know, the IMF and other, you know, capitalist financial uh, centers, and because of, um, you know, problems within South Africa, uh, you know, because of uh, the kind of um, 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 difficult internal difficulties, political, uh, you know, but also uh, the the ways in which a struggle never unfolds exactly as one imagines it. Uh, and so there's been a, a kind of depression, I think. Uh, uh, we, we've been look, you know, we thought we thought Brazil for a time would be would play the role that South Africa failed to play in the aftermath of the overturning of uh, apartheid. And then and then what did we experience? Uh, so I'm saying all of this. I have this long preface to uh, my uh, remark that 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 you know whatever the eventual outcome of the um, court decision, the fact that South Africa um, stood up to represent uh, for Palestine has, I think, created new hope in 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 the world, uh, and um, I think that. Um, um, those of us um, who um, felt that uh, we had invested so much in the struggle against apartheid, and then we were, in a sense, let down. Uh, we can now uh, we can now look at South Africa uh, and its alliance uh, with Palestine on the world stage and say that it was worthwhile to engage in all of those years of struggle to dismantle uh, apartheid. So I'm totally impressed with the work that South Africa has done. Uh, uh, it's, um, uh, it, I think, is having an impact on people everywhere. A source of hope. Could it be? I mean, could it be like, I mean, I'm trying to be maybe utopian, a, a rebellion of the global South and in a way the end of U.S. hegemony? You know, the U.S. has always, uh, you know, scared countries to act because they said, watch out, we're the boss. If you act, we'll cut this, we'll cut that. You know, South Africa took a risk and a lot of countries followed, you know, and said they're going to support it. So in an ideal world, could it be the beginning of the end for U.S. Hege hegemony? Well, of course, that is our hope. Uh, um, and uh, the definitive end of U.S. hegemony is going to require a lot more struggle at many different levels. But I think this moment allows us to concretely glimpse a future 
in which the ideological whole of the U.S. Uh, is not so uh, powerful over so much of, uh, of the world. Uh, the fact that the court um, made the ruling that it did, of course, you know, everyone was disappointed that uh, we didn't get a ceasefire. Uh, uh, but um, but there are many reasons, of course, why that uh, didn't happen. I think that that was, in many ways, the best possible uh, outcome of, uh, at least in relation to the preliminary uh, uh, report. And, um, uh, you know, as all of us have been watching, what we uh, regard as a genocide unfolding before our eyes, uh, uh, the, to hear the, the president of the court uh, uh, read uh, the the ruling that incorporated so much of the language uh, that South Africa uh, had 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 used, and and the fact that the president of the course is from the United States, uh, um, considering that the U.S. is the greatest ally of of Israel, and um, the only judge who didn't sign. Was from Uganda, and I don't. I really don't understand that, uh, uh, especially since U U Uganda, Uganda, whatever one might think about Uganda, Uganda uh, disassociated itself uh, from uh, the that judge's uh, position. Uh, so this was a virtually unanimous decision, uh, and I think that. Uh, whatever legal impact it might have, the most important impact is going to be uh, on um, other states and individuals around the world who now uh, have a stronger framework to engage in the work that we need to be doing in order to bring an end to this genocidal war. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, the ICJ, uh, you know, provisional measures where like, you know, you, when you've got a, a box of tools, you know, that you, you use during a struggle, this is a massive tool for us, for legal experts, also for, for citizens. So this is going to be uh, very important. And it's not over. I mean, South Africa could ask for other provisional measures if Israel doesn't respect these ones. So it's, it's an ongoing story. I want to end uh, by asking you like one question into two or two questions into one. Uh, Arundhati Roy, her again, uh, said in the middle of COVID, and you remember that, uh, that COVID was a portal. Uh, I don't know if you rem remember when she said that. I was wondering, and that's not my question, but it's, it's already a question. Do you think Palestine could be a portal? I mean, I'm just, I'm going to answer, I'm going to answer it for you the way I think. For me, Palestine is a microcosm of everything that is wrong with the world in terms of racial capitalism, in terms of colonialism, in terms of genocidal policies and apartheid. But it's also through the work of many people, through the hundreds of thousands of people that have stopped everything in the last three months to focus on Palestine, a portal into what could be the world, if you know what I mean, right? So that's part of my question. And you've said actually a lot of time that Palestine, for you, was a, was a moral litmus test for the world. So I was wondering what you meant by that. And if you agree that Palestine could be actually the portal that maybe South Africa wasn't, the post-apartheid South Africa. Um, well, you know, um, Frank, as Stuart Hall said, there are never any guarantees. Uh, uh, there are no guarantees. But it is important. Um, and I, I like to say to act as if it were possible uh, to to change the world, uh, to um, uh, not only to imagine but actually to bring into existence uh, uh, a, a moment in the history of the globe uh, when uh, uh, exploitation and 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 racism and war are are not the primary features of human society. And, um, you know, I think that um, what I find so inspiring is that 
so many people, regardless of the particular efforts they are involved in, uh, so many social justice activists uh, have turned their uh, attention uh, to Palestine. You know, whether you're talking about feminist uh, uh, organizations, L LGBTQ movements, abolitionist campaigns, climate activism, uh, food justice uh, 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 movements. And we see this happening. We see this happening on uh, the continent of Africa. Uh, we see it happening in Australia. We see it you know, happening um, in South America. Uh, so I, 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 I'm, rem I'm remembering a moment when I spoke um, in a rural area of Brazil uh, uh, as they were attempting to build a new university system that would admit uh, that would admit um, uh, uh, Afro Brazilians, people of, of of African descent, in in Brazil, and. I remember, you know, as you said, I always like to mention Palestine, uh, and this was some years ago. And I, and 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 I, I mentioned how important it was to link our struggles with what was happening in Palestine, and the thousands of people who were present there just erupted into massive applause, uh, which um, which I did not expect. Uh, uh, and so now when I see the images of vast numbers of people demonstrating in country after country after country, it um, it reminds me uh, that um, that these connections across national borders are possible, uh, that Palestine uh, is allowing us to imagine a very different kind of world. Uh, and so... Uh, we struggle for justice for Palestine, not because it is the moral thing to do, which it is, uh, um, not because it is uh, 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 the only way in which we can imagine a future for people who live in that part of the world, which it is, uh, but um, because it uh, represents uh, uh, a capacity uh, to build new lives and 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 new dreams uh, for people everywhere, uh, and and so I'm, you know, while I'm extremely sad to have to witness uh, the damage and devastation that has been inflicted by Israel, who prefaced their war uh, by referring to. The, the defense minister, at least, referring to uh, Palestinians as human animals, uh, uh, that um, I, 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 I believe that that awakens something in people everywhere, and including, I'm hoping, increasingly among Jewish people inside uh, Israel. The one thing that I should point out that has been so inspiring is the fact that young Jewish people have taken the lead in this struggle, uh, have called for and given leadership to demonstrations uh, that are happening all over the U.S. Uh, uh, and um, it, does, um, it does make us uh, dream of, uh, of a world in which we will have eradicated uh, racism and anti-Semitism and economic exploitation and gender uh, uh, violence. Uh, so yeah, we deposit our dreams, I think, uh, in Palestine. Thanks, Angela. What a what an amazing way to uh, to finish. Um, I think you know again, you're entirely right. We we need to believe in our dreams, otherwise, you know the the who's going to struggle you know Howard Zinn said that you know the struggle needs to be um, exhilarating and uh, and and in a way joyful and beautiful because if if it's not you know who else going to join so um <laughs> I, I think you know despite the horror we have to try to focus on on, on the beauty to to keep going so um, again thanks again Angela um and um We'll speak soon. And a happy bel belated birthday. It's been three Thank days. You. So. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Frank. Okay. And thank you for all that you do. Uh, oh, you know. And that you I'm... continue to do. <laughs> Thanks, Angela. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.